This video was brought to you by my loyal patrons. Pledge today and you can participate in choosing what video comes to the channel next. Link in the description. Dear Christopher, Here is your friend Thomas the Tank Engine. He wanted to come out of his station yard and see the world. These stories tell you how he did it. Welcome back everyone. We have now left the golden era of Thomas, and we're now in the post-movie seasons. And as we all know, this is where things start to take a turn. Season 6 is the first season I can honestly say I don't have many fond memories for from childhood. Not because I thought it was bad as a kid, but because it came about in the years I felt myself starting to grow out of Thomas. Of course, that never stuck and I came back to it. But Season 6 is sort of an anomaly in that sense, meaning I have no strong attachment to it, unlike the previous ones. So I think this retrospective will be rather interesting, a perspective from someone who doesn't really have any nostalgic feelings towards it. So without further ado, let's jump in and see what the world of post-movie Thomas has to offer. Thomas and the Magic Railroad was a box office flop. While it brought Thomas to a wider global audience, its financial blunder led to some changes that occurred before production of the next season. Britt Alcroft was forced to step down as head of her own company, the Britt Alcroft Company, which was subsequently renamed Golan Entertainment in late 2000 following Britt's departure. She would continue on as the executive producer for the next season, having little input on the new stories. Season 6 would be the only season distributed by Ghislaine until the hit entertainment buyout the following year in 2003. More on that when we get to Season 7. Thomas was under new management now with Ghislaine, and their ultimate goal was, now that the movie had brought the show to a bigger global audience, was to churn out more content a new season every year, and a companion spin-off series. Gotta get that dough. Thomas would now put out a new season of 26 episodes every year starting with season 6 in 2002, contrast to before when there was a couple year gap between seasons. So, of course, there were some changes in the management. With a new yearly quota of 26 episodes, a team of all new writers were brought in to write all the episodes. These new writers included Paul Larson, Abby Grant, Brian Truman and his son Jonathan, Robin Kingsland, and others, some of which would go on to write for the show for years to come. Series director David Mitten had his duties changed too. As well as director, he went on to be the new script consultant. Mitten would basically pitch story ideas to the new writing crew, and then they would go and write out full scripts. This wasn't the case for every episode, though. Only the ones that Mitten pitched concepts for are the ones in which he is given a story by credit for. Season 6 was notable for hosting a soft pilot for Thomas's first, and so far only, spin-off series, originally called Jack and the Pack, and later retitled Jack and the Sodor Construction Company. The idea was to create a companion show for Thomas, this one focused on sentient construction vehicles that all lived and worked on the island of Sodor and sometimes interacted with the engines that we're all familiar with. I plan on covering Jack and the Pack in the retrospective series, so I'll go more into detail on its conception then. These construction vehicles were all giant props, and they had to be big so they could fit all the needed electronics and hydraulics in them to make their arms and shovels move. Since they were so big, they used the giant Gage 3 Thomas and Percy that they built back in Season 5 to interact with them. As far as I'm aware, all the Jack character props were built during Season 6's production, though not all appeared in the soft pilot. The soft pilot was a two-parter, with the episodes Jack Jumps In and A Friend in Need, both of which were directed by longtime show veteran Steve Asquith. The first time episodes from the series were directed by someone other than David Mitten. The planned 26 episode Jack and the Pack first season was intended to premiere the next year alongside season 7. That didn't happen of course, but more on all that later. 
There was a slight change in the visual style from the previous seasons. The engine props retained their new matte paint jobs from Magic Railroad, forever ditching those darker colors and glossy sheens from Season 5 that made them look so real. The reason they claimed they did this was so that they would show up better on camera. And while that might have been the case for the movie, I'm inclined to believe they kept doing this in the show to make them look more toy-like and attractive to kids. Hence the new bright neon highlighter colors this year. Yeah, not a fan personally. This is also notably the first season filmed in 16x9 widescreen. However, it's weird. The first six episodes of the season are all 4x3, with some shots in them being 16x9, and the remaining 20 episodes are all 16x9. It's so confusing, and I don't know why it was done like this or how it even happened. Did they change their minds and switch the aspect ratio midway through the season? Who knows? On all the widescreen DVD releases of Season 6, the first six episodes are horridly cropped into 16x9, and so much of the picture is lost. Once you notice it, you can't unnotice it. This switching between aspect ratios personally drives me nuts. So for the sake of consistency, I'm just going to use the 4x3 crops of all the episodes for this video. Another notable innovation for Season 6 was its exclusive intro. The intro remained mostly the same as it had before, except now the classic shot of Thomas passing the windmill was replaced with a shot of Thomas passing the windmill in the winter and then crossing the watermill. This new intro was only a thing for this one season, and then they returned to the normal one in Season 7. No one has ever stated why this change was made, so I guess it was just to freshen things up again? Who knows? Bizarre decisions everywhere. This would also be the final season to use the full title, Thomas the Tank Engine and Friends. In Season 7 onwards, the title would be shortened to only Thomas and Friends, and start to use the Steam Cloud logo that we're all so familiar with. Both Michael Angelus and Alec Baldwin returned once again as the narrators for the UK and US dubs respectively. While Angelus would go on as the UK narrator for years to come, this would be Baldwin's last season after only narrating two seasons and starring in the movie. Season 6 began its filming in September 2001 and was completed in March of 2002. The season premiered in the UK in September with the episode Salty's Secret. The first thing I notice about Season 6 from this latest rewatch is how scaled back everything feels compared to Season 5. I don't mean that like the sets look smaller or anything. What I mean is that it feels like they tried to reel everything in a bit and cut out the fat. An example of what I mean is instead of having Bill and Ben work at their quarry and Mavis at another, now they've just combined them and they all work at the same quarry now. Several secondary and tertiary characters basically disappeared, you know, like Boko, Daisy, Derek, etc. There is a lot of focus on the main characters this season, but that doesn't mean every secondary was neglected. The overall color palette isn't as vibrant, the lighting is kind of flat, and the engines are no longer in their glossy paint jobs. They don't play with tone as much in a meaningful way such as Season 5 did, or really attempt to try and wow the audience with groundbreaking, amazing looking sets. Everything looks and feels just a little faker, and more... sterile. This is still classic Thomas, technically, but something feels off, like some of the life has been sucked out. No doubt a major part of this was the result of a team of writers taking charge instead of Britt and David being the creative voices behind everything. Naturally, as when new writers are brought in that aren't as familiar with the franchise, inconsistencies started rearing their ugly heads. And they're all over the place here, with characters, their dialogue, the logic of where certain locations are placed, and the overall storytelling. Interestingly, locations started being called by their proper names instead of simplistic terms. The Big Station is now called by its proper name, Knapford Station. The Sheds is now properly Tidmouth Sheds, and the Docks is now Brendam Docks. This is a fairly subtle change, and I think the reason why is marketing. 
Kids will probably want a Brendam Docks or a Tidmus Sheds playset just a bit more if they recognize the names on the box. While this is such a minute change in the grand scheme of things, it's just one of many things that dragged the show slowly away from the more simple, storybook-like world of the original series and books, and into more of a corporate entity. Episodes now start with Fluff explaining how happy the engines are and the jobs that they enjoy doing. The engines on the island of Sodor are good at different things. Gordon is a very good express. Percy is good at carrying the mail. Sir Topham Hatt's engines love their work. Gordon likes pulling the express. Thomas likes his branch line. And Percy likes taking the mail. It's all information that we already know, but they feel the need to re-establish these facts as if it's the first time someone is watching the episodes. Which very well may be the intention, since the widespread of the movie means a lot of kids around the world likely were watching for the first time. To me though, this feels like unnecessary padding and messes up the pace of the stories. If this were seasons 1 through 5, we'd more than often just jump right into the story. Morals started becoming more obvious and flat out stated. The beauty of the original stories is that they all have morals, yes, but they were never outright said. The writing treated the young audience with a level of intelligence to know what the takeaway is. Like, if James runs his mouth off, and then he crashes, it's pretty clear the takeaway is, don't run your mouth off, or it'll come back to bite you in the end. Now the characters have to say what the lesson is out loud so it's clear for the young audience. Everyone makes mistakes, said Thomas. Even you. Sometimes it takes time to make new friends. And we all have to say sorry sometimes. I don't know if this was an intentional thing to sort of dumb down the stories, or if it's just a result of lazier writing. Sadly, this will be a trend for the show moving forward. The lack of a railway consultant is felt greatly too. Without Wilbur Audrey's or David Maidman's input, we're starting to see very unrealistic railway practice for the sake of allowing stories to happen. Such as Thomas being propelled down the line at mock speed and somehow not derailing. Vans being left at an abandoned mine for Percy to collect just because. Some cracks in the track lead Sir Topham Hatt to closing the entire Scarlowy Railway. But their line is in bad condition. I am going to shut it down. Percy going up on a coal loader and neither he nor the loader sustain any damage. And Thomas being able to just push through snow without a plow. That last one isn't really a railway practice thing, it's more of a basic physics thing. That, that isn't how snow works. Before, stories were crafted within the limits of what was possible on a real working railway. And that was part of the charm. Thomas felt real because it, for the most part, abided by these rules and the writers were forced to be creative with these limits. I personally don't mind if a rule is broken every now and then. These are trains with faces after all, they should have some leeway. Especially if it's done intentionally for some thematic purpose. But when it's happening so frequently that it seems to be a trend in almost every episode of a season, that's when the magic starts to get a bit lost. But the biggest downgrade of the season for me, personally, is the characters. Many of the main characters are pretty inconsistent with their former selves, and revert back to how they were earlier in the show before they matured. Gordon is back to being pompous and just seems unhappy to be around the others. You slow engines will never understand because you'll never go as fast as me. Edward is just pathetic now and old now and no one respects him. He should be retired. And the other big engines agreed with him. Percy has become basically a child, questioning everything and always mispronouncing it for some reason. What's a demonstration? Demonstration, said Thomas. In James and the Red Balloon, Thomas and James are flanderized as total idiots. Just so a scenario about a hot air balloon landing on James can happen. Oh no, James, cried Thomas. You saved the hot air balloon. I didn't mean to, groaned James. Now it's sure to take our passengers. Okay, but how? It's a real shame to see the characters reduced like this, just so a plot can happen. It's easy to just blame the writers for these issues, but I don't think it's entirely their fault. I have to assume this is all a byproduct of the new yearly schedule. Now with 26 new episodes required every year, there's a lot less time for the writers to go over their content and make sure it's all up to snuff. 
Prior, there was a big gap of a few years between seasons, and this gap allowed the team ample amounts of time to craft seasons to be the best that they could. Now everything feels a bit more rushed, and all the inconsistencies are all the more glaring. I will say this though, while I think the overall story quality did take a dive this year, these episodes are definitely not boring. They're all still edited at a brisk pace, and it feels like a lot actually happens in what are short 5 minute episodes. They're still very in the style of the seasons prior. Thomas is not a boring show yet, although we're not far off. On a much, much more positive note, let's talk about the narrators. Michael Angelus, once again, brings his all this season. He's as energetic as ever with his line deliveries, rivaling his already brilliant performance in Season 5. Look at the little green engine, Alicia Botti exclaimed. So sweet and a dirty, like a proper steam engine. Peasant. Yes, I am pleasant. The driver tried to put on the brakes, but Thomas couldn't stop. Oh, boy! This is a man who very clearly loves his job. Alec Baldwin, on the other hand, notably isn't trying as hard as he did in Season 5. He sounds a lot more relaxed and less try-hard this season. He stopped doing the really cartoony character voices. Yeah, I know, he doesn't attempt the Scottish accent for Donald and Douglas, and that is sinful. Stop being pushy, Donald snapped. Don't call me pushy, Douglas snapped back. However, I don't think that makes him a bad narrator, per se. A good narrator, in my opinion, has a voice you enjoy listening to, that fits the tone of the stories, can do the right inflections needed for the tone of a scene. And I think that Baldwin is still very pleasant to the ear. Those who say he didn't try at all, I respectfully disagree with. He clearly gives a good performance here. He barely made it round the Cape. After a hundred scary days at sea without a scratch, he sailed into port and crashed his bow not 15 feet from my buffers. And here. Ah! cried James. What's happening? Crash, bang, wallop went the balloon and landed right on top of James. And here. He's after me! I don't think you'll be late, said Duck. Not to mention, he gave all the new characters their own unique voices. We heaved until the old freighter finally caught the tide. That would be vintage steam truck. And I haven't much time to get to your coupling rods. More help means more dirt. More dirt means more fun. I'm Alfie. Hello, James. Come to learn a thing or two from those who know. I can't possibly travel in coaches riddled with mice. I do agree with the majority that Season 6 Baldwin is a step down from Season 5 Baldwin, but I don't think he is all bad here. He's still a pretty good narrator, if you ask me. But I do think Angelus is the clear winner of the two this year. She screamed so loud and so long that windows broke all over town. Definitely a coloratura, said Gordon. <laughs> Season 6 is really not all bad, though. While it has its share of gimmicky episodes, it also has a good selection of grounded, character-driven stories, too. Salty's Secret, Scaredy Engines, and No Sleep for Cranky are all good examples of stories where the character's actions drive the story drama. Or The Fogmen, in which the one who learns the lesson is Sir Topham Hatt of all characters. Instead of replacing Cyril with the Foghorn, we'll replace the Foghorn with Cyril. You're clearly more reliable. I'd like to point out this episode is about Sir Topham Hatt learning that replacing human jobs with machine intelligence is a mistake. An episode about 20 years ahead of its time, huh? These episodes are where the season is at its best in my opinion. Just letting the characters' antics carry the stories, instead of making the characters act untrue of themselves just so a gimmicky crash can happen, of which they can then market for toys. Season 6 continues the show's continual world building, but not in a geography sense, instead with all its new characters. There's not any real new major locations introduced this season, but we do get a lot of new faces, and all of them have a purpose. Instead of adding more locations to the island, instead they add more characters to fill out those locations more, and bulk up other characters. Salty becomes the main character associated with the docks. Harvey is now a face connected with the breakdown train and rescue scenes. Elizabeth introduces some lore to Sir Topham Hatt in his younger years. Oh, 
it's you, said Elizabeth, looking down at Sir Topham Hatt. Have you learned to drive properly yet? She's in trouble now, said Thomas to his driver. Elizabeth, my first truck. I thought you had been lost. Oh, you gotta be kidding me. And we, of course, see an all-new view of the world of Sodor from the roads with Jack and the pack. All the new characters fit into the universe rather seamlessly, in my opinion. In third place this year, we have James with three total leading roles. In second place, we have Thomas with six. And in first place, we have, to no one's shock, Percy with seven. What is this, the fourth time Percy's won first? I feel like we're going to be seeing Thomas, Percy, and James having the most leads quite a few more times as we continue on. A lot of characters did things this year. Some for good and some not so good. Let's start with Thomas. I'm happy to say that Thomas has not changed much from the previous season. He seems to still be the mature character that he grew into by season 5, still being the voice of reason most of the time. I enjoy the moments this year where he shows what a good character he's become, like how he feels sorry for Harvey when he's being put down, or how he cheers for Jack when he gets accepted into the pack. I love that aspects of his old character are still intact though, such as his disdain for snowplows, big horrid awkward thing, Thomas grumbled, and his fear of ghosts. There's no such thing as ghosts, who's there? He's still the same old Thomas, and at least he's consistent in that sense. I do see some slips starting to occur with him though. Thomas's cockiness rears its ugly head in stories like Scaredy Engines or Thomas Percy and the Squeak. Two episodes where he treats Percy pretty awfully. Move aside, dirty Percy, chuffed Thomas. I'm the important engine today. I'm personally okay with this. It still feels pretty true to who Thomas is, and it shows that even our hero character, while matured, is still flawed. And that's important in a main character. If Thomas was perfect all the time, then he'd be pretty boring, wouldn't he? That being said, a couple characters were reinvented a bit this year, which sort of resets the status quo for them moving forward. Some more so than others, and some worse than others. Let's talk about Gordon, who got the worst of it in my opinion. Throughout the entire season, Gordon is always pompous, always rude, always boastful, just a jerk. Him using the word dignified to describe himself also got its start here. Express engines don't pull freight cars, it wouldn't be dignified. I know Gordon being pompous is part of his character, but there was always more to him than that. Like, where's the big brother side of his character? It's a real shame when years ago, Gordon learned to respect Edward. Duck and Boko saw to it that Edward was left in peace. Gordon and James remained respectfully silent. And then they stuck to it for several seasons, only to forget that it ever happened. Edward is a useless old steampot. He should be retired. And with that, let's segue into Edward now. Edward doesn't do a whole lot this year, but it's so clear to me that the new writers had no idea what type of character he's supposed to be. Like, they knew he was the old one. Okay, so... We'll just make all the other characters think he's frail and unable to be useful. But then sometimes they'll have Edward just sort of group think with the others and be just as rude as them. He doesn't even look like an engine, said Edward. Atrocious. Mavis is an example of a character reinvention that I think is pretty positive. This is the first time since her introduction back in season 3 that she's been given something substantial to do. In this season, we see she's grown into a rather responsible, motherly character who looks after Bill and Ben. No, I'm not. Yes, you are. Will you two stop being crab pots? Mavis scolded. And lends a listening ear to a rather upset Salty. Now, I don't know if I should mark this down as character inconsistency or character growth. I'm hesitant to say it's growth since we didn't see the actual, you know, growth part, but it's still nice nonetheless. I like how Mavis stays this mature type of character for pretty much the rest of the series. Diesel makes his big return this year, and now he's just kind of a fool. Prior, he was a cunning villain that pulled strings behind the scenes to get what he wanted. Now he's egotistical and wants to pull as many trucks as possible just to show he's better than Henry. 
Diesel's return here establishes that he will be a mainstay in the show moving forward, and that he is no longer the same cunning villain he was from the past. Now he's just a tryhard. That's me, the world's strongest engine. Ari and Bert, while pretty minor characters, got a very similar treatment. No longer are they sinister demons from hell that lurk in the shadows at the scrapyards and escort steam engines to their doom. Now they're just generic bully diesels, two of many. Little green piggy in the middle, Ari teased. How far they've fallen. This is Ari and Bert for the rest of their appearances in the show, pretty much. I'm of the opinion that Ari and Bert should have appeared once in season 5, nameless, and never appeared again. They'd be so much more memorable and impactful that way. All the Diesels being morphed into this singular bully entity is another example of the season scaling things back that I mentioned earlier. It's just taking everything and simplifying them. Cranky, on a lighter note, got expanded on quite a bit. Cranky feels like an actual character now. In Season 5, he had one major role where he was just an ass to the engines, and that was kind of it for him. A good character concept, and one that I liked, but a somewhat flat one. This season, we see a new side to Cranky. The guy is overworked, and we grow to understand why he is the way he is. Why he has the name Cranky. We all thought he was cranky last year because we were seeing him through the engine's perspective. He's high and mighty and physically above the engines, so he must just think he's better. Then he looks down and sees you two little engines being annoying. But now we find out his jaded personality comes from his never going anywhere, always being expected to work. He never gets to sleep early. He works all the time. He never gets to sleep or take a vacation. He literally can't. He's a crane. He's stuck in place. And his only company are the gulls that settle on his arm. He becomes surprisingly sympathetic. I'm so glad that they gave him some focus. There are a handful of new faces this year, but the one that I want to talk about is Salty. Salty, pride of the seven seas. I'm a new diesel and I'm here to give you some help. Salty, in my opinion, is a very unique character, and he fits right into the show like a glove. So it's company you be needing, said Salty. Reminds me of a lonely old Grand Banks lighthouse keeper. I also love how Salty doesn't take crap from anyone. Neither the big engines or the little demons, Bill and Ben. He's a character that can really stand on his own, and nothing gets him down. The only thing that does is when the one thing he is the most passionate about is taken away from him. You really do miss the sea, don't you? asked Mavis. I said Salty. I do. Right away, in his first episode, Salty shows that he has some layers to him. Way to make a good first impression. But of all the characters, I think the one that deserves the MVP award this year, over anyone else, is Percy. Yes, Percy. You finally got it. Percy, like many others, was also subject to some flanderization this season, being made into the dumb one of the group. Because it wouldn't be dignified. Dingy fried, puzzled Percy? What's that? But what I really enjoy about Percy in Season 6 is that they used all his major character dynamics introduced in the show so far. His friendship with Thomas is trialed in two different episodes. His alliance with Duck gets some light again. Some fun rivalry stories with James. And some focus with Harold. It's like the new writers were told to use Percy a lot this year. And so they pulled out all the stops. The season sort of feels like a celebration of Percy, if you will. I think the standout episode of Season 6 rightfully goes to... Thomas the Jet Engine. Purely for just how insane it is. No doubt anyone who watched this season as a kid remembers this one. It's a very unrealistic episode, but a very funny one. Hi Gordon! Bye Gordon! Probably the funniest episode of the classic era. Want to race Thomas beat Bertie? Never mind. If I were to pick an episode that I think is actually great, then I'd choose Scaredy Engines. This is an episode where all three of its main characters are written wonderfully. It's a story with a great moral about friendship, accompanied by great nighttime and spooky cinematography. 
It's an episode I've grown to really love more and more over the years. It's just a feel-good story that makes me feel all warm and fuzzy inside by the end. I think Scaredy Engines has more merit though as an actually great, well-written character episode, while Jet Engine is more just gimmick and spectacle, but nonetheless, still very memorable. The worst episode is, and get ready for this one, Edward the Really Useful Engine. Now this is an episode I have grown to despise over the years. It is, in my opinion, the epitome of all of Season 6's problems. Long, excessive exposition fluff at the beginning that tells us what all the engine's jobs are. Total regressed characterization for all of its main characters. Edward is a useless old steampot, Gordon sniffed. And the other big engines agreed with him. An absolutely bizarre railway practice. I just don't understand it. What exactly was Sir Topham Hatt's plan here? He just happened to know the trucks would cause duck to stall on the hill and block the express? So he willingly delayed the express just to teach Gordon a lesson? It's so convoluted. It has nothing redeeming about it in my opinion. There are some other pretty baffling bad episodes this year too, like Percy and the Haunted Mine or Rusty Saves the Day. But my heart tells me Edward the Really Useful Engine is the season's worst. Just for what it did to two of the show's strongest characters. It's good to be back, Edward chuffed happily. What do you mean by that? You didn't leave. Funnily enough, they sort of redo this episode way later on in the CGI series. The episode Old Reliable Edward has basically the same plot, but it plays out in a much better way where Edward is an active participant in teaching Gordon a lesson. Oh, but I didn't think you needed any help from me. After all, I'm so old and unreliable. It's like the writer of that episode, Andrew Brenner, knew this was a bad episode and said, you know what? I'm going to rewrite it and actually make it good. The sum up of the season is, in my opinion, Percy's Chocolate Crunch. This is not a bad episode per se, but it's a rather uninteresting one with somewhat flat characterization. Percy is always dirty and wants to be clean. Like, that's it. That's the plot. It's an episode that is only memorable for its humorous bits. Hello, Percy, he called. And he took off, blowing cinders and ashes everywhere. And it's absolutely insane crash sequence. <laughs> sort of embodies season six as a whole, in my opinion. But my favorite episode of the season is No Sleep for Cranky. This is a fantastic character episode. There's not so much an event that occurs here and more just characters interacting, but that's why I love it and it's hilarious. Whoops, said Cranky meekly. This episode really solidifies what Salty's role is in the show. He's a foil for Cranky, someone who is always so joyful and full of life for Cranky to bounce his negative outlook on life on. Ahoy there, Cranky, cried Salty. Where have you been, snapped Cranky. And a good day to you too, Captain. The SpongeBob and Squidward of Thomas. The CGI series would play with this so much more later on, and it all got its start here. This is one of the rare episodes where there is no moral. It's basically just... Cranky's life sucks, doesn't it? I love it. Even what is a rather weak season, it's great to see that they still have a good sense of humor. Luckily, no one was hurt. Except my ears wailed Cranky. I think the word that defines season six is... cute. Cute is a word that can both be endearing and an insult. It's not exactly a glowing word of recommendation, nor a malicious one. Just like Season 6, it's somewhere in the middle. Season 6 is a rather nullified version of the show that we got previously. A slight downgrade, a little bit dumber, a little bit flatter, but overall, still enjoyable. It's a mixed bag, I find, especially in comparison to the first five seasons. This one has not aged the best visually, and kind of sets the groundwork for the turn the show will take in a couple years. That being said, I don't think it's all bad. 
I still enjoy Season 6 quite a bit if I'm honest. It introduced a lot of great new characters, most of which carried on well into the CGI era. Its high points do outweigh its low points, so it's overall a decent season. But that's all it is. Not horrendous, or great, or even good. It's just... decent. It's fine. It exists. I'm sorry this retrospective wasn't as positive as the previous ones. I'll be honest, I didn't think I was going to be this harsh on it. But sadly, I see the cracks starting to form here with this season. And I'm very curious now how Season 7 will fare in the retrospective in light of this. Will it be a step up now that the writers have tested the waters a bit? Or will it be worse and continue the downward spiral? I guess we will find out in the next episode. Hello all, Nick here, aka The Unlucky Tug, in the flesh again. Uh, again, I don't really do the whole showing face on camera thing that often, but considering the situation, I figured it was appropriate. Um, I want to use this opportunity to give you all an update on what's happening with the channel. So, uh, if for some reason you have not heard the news and are just finding out about it now, through this video, uh, allow me to give you an update on what's happened. The original Unlucky Tug channel that stood at 250k subscribers was terminated um, a little over a month ago now. Um, the reason being that it shared an email address with another channel that was terminated for copyright strikes. Unlucky Tug itself had zero copyright strikes and was in very good standing. Um, but it doesn't matter. According to Google's policy, if it shares an email with a terminated channel, then you lose all your channels and you get locked out of YouTube. Google did a terrible job of communicating that with me and I've spent the last few weeks trying to fight it. Um, I've tried contacting Google and YouTube a zillion times. Um, I've even tried getting in contact with the, the claimant uh, who commission the copyright strikes. Um, I've heard nothing from them. Several emails, several phone calls, nothing. No one wants to help. Uh, everything's a bot now, which is just very, very unfortunate. <laughs> but it is what it is. Um, but of course, I, I don't want to wait around and do nothing. So I, I made this channel. This is the new channel. So the plan is that I would upload all of my old videos to this channel because I have the majority of them saved. Um, and everything on the channel is from the comeback in 2020. So that's the Big World Big Adventures, big review, all the way up to now. And everything should be up now with a few exceptions. There's a few videos that I unfortunately have lost over time and I don't think anyone else saved. Um, people have been asking like, oh, are, are you skipping videos? Why are you skipping videos? No, I'm not intentionally skipping videos. I, I just don't have them. Uh, those videos are Thomas Comes Home, which was a little music video edit I did as a sort of like compliment to the Big World Big Adventures review, kind of like showing this could have been the end. Sadly, that's gone. I didn't save that. Um, the top 11 Thomas episodes you should watch also gone. I didn't have that one saved, and I don't think anyone else saved that one either. I tried to get it on Wayback Machine, and sadly wasn't archived, so that one's gone. The 2021 and 2022 New Year's videos, also gone. I have the 2023 one saved, but I don't think people really, uh, is there really a demand for those? I don't know. <laughs> so, yeah, there might be a couple other, like, smaller videos that I'm forgetting, uh, but... Basically, if I didn't upload it to the channel here, then I don't have it, sadly. If you do have it, like you saved it, let me know. Send it to me and then I'll re-upload it. I would appreciate that. Um, Thomas Debunked. Uh, that was that series of shorts I did. Uh, I don't really plan on coming back to that short series. So I think the best thing to do would be like uploading all of those as a big compilation video. I think there were like 34 or like 35 different shorts in that, which is a lot. So I think this one big video of that might be pretty fun. So I'll probably do that. Um, people have been asking about the pre-comeback videos. So like old Unlucky Tug, like the the Great Race review and the old Thoughts On and all of those. Um, 
thankfully, a lot of those have been saved by WTL Network. Thank you again, mate, for doing that. Like, saved my life. <laughs> um, so a lot of those will be posted into a drive folder. I'm not really actually happy with those videos. Uh, I, just from an editing standpoint, I don't think they're as good. The audio quality is terrible, and my opinions in them don't really reflect my opinions now. <laughs> So, but I don't want to like delete them forever. I know people enjoy them. So what I'll do is I'll put them in a drive folder, um, which I haven't done at the time of recording this video, but by the time this is out, I'll have it ready. And that will be in the description of below of this, the video you're watching now. So what can you do? What can you do about the channel? Uh, the best thing that you can do, uh, honestly, is just spread awareness of this new channel. Tell people that Unlucky Tug is not dead. He is still around. He's on this new channel doing what he's always done. Um, via Twitter, Reddit, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube comments, whatever. Whatever by means necessary. All word of mouth is really helpful here. Just let people know I'm not dead. I do want to give a big thanks to everyone who has helped spread the word so far. These are people that have like made videos on the termination and the new channel and community posts. Uh, like Caleb Train, Enterprise and Engine 93, uh, Victor Tanzig, Train of Thought. So many people. I, I can't remember everyone, but you all did a great service to me. And it's just, I appreciate it so much. Thank you for doing that. And I want to give a huge thank you to all the patrons too you guys have been so loyal and supportive it's it's been great everyone there has been so uplifting and supportive through this and i just i i appreciate that so much and what is a very trying time it's nice to know that there are people that you know have your back out there and that's been great so you guys are awesome thank you for that so now I want to talk about uh, what's going to happen now. Uh, what's next on the new channel. Honestly, um, I just plan on continuing right where I left off. So we have the Season 6 retrospective out now. Next one will be Season 7 and so on. And I'll continue that series. Soder's Finest, of course. I'll continue to make new ones. Um, and we'll just keep going from there. Uh, the next video is actually near completion already, um, and it is the top 10 hidden gems of Modern Thomas. Um, it's basically a video where I go through 10 overlooked episodes of the CGI series that I think are actually awesome. Uh, these are ones that like people don't really talk about, like not tip for tat or love me tender or something. These are underappreciated greats in my opinion. Um, it's a chance to give the CGI series some much needed love. Um, we're sometimes kind of harsh on the CGI series here when really it did some pretty great things and I think this would be a good video to sort of acknowledge that. Uh, th this video has been on the Patreon poll for months now but it never gets voted for so but I really wanted to make it so I said screw it I'm making it. <laughs> so that'll be the next uh, big video on the channel. I'll keep you all updated when that's ready. Uh, Tug's Trains will also be returning, um, but in a new form. It will be in the form of YouTube Shorts. Uh, basically, each one will just be like a quick spotlight of a different model in the collection. This will be Thomas ones, or it'll be random ones, just so we have a nice variety. Um, I've wanted to do this even before the original channel termination. It's something that I kind of had planned in the works. So uh, I'm happy I finally get to do it. Um, I've made 10 to start with, and we'll kind of see how it goes from there. We'll experiment a bit and see how shorts perform. Um, and the first one of those will be posted on Monday, uh, this coming Monday. And we'll do one a day after that. I'm excited to see how that's gonna go over. And I'm excited to show you guys that. And um, I think that's about it from me. If there is miraculously an update on the original channel's recovery, I of course will let you all know. Um, keep your fingers crossed. Hopefully it'll happen. We'll see. But if not, then we're just going to keep trudging on right here, like before. <laughs> uh, you know what they say, uh, don't be sad that it ended, be glad that it happened. So, hope you all have a great day, everyone, and I will see you all 
in the next one.